Just a few decades ago, Chicago was tearing down its architectural landmarks with a vengeance. One man fought to save the buildings of Louis Sullivan. He wound up being the lonely advocate of preservation because there was nobody else to do it. He thought these were masterpieces. I am on this earth on Sullivan's behalf, and I have only begun to fight. It was a battle that would cost him his life. The Richard Nichols story, next on Chicago Stories. Good evening, I'm John Calloway and welcome to Chicago Stories. According to the photographer Richard Nickel, it is a tragedy that these architectural fragments are here at the Art Institute of Chicago. He believed they belonged on intact buildings. Our Chicago Stories explores the crusade of Richard Nickel to save old Chicago buildings at a time when few people cared. And when he couldn't save the buildings, he tried to save pieces of them. But this is not only the story of Richard Nichols' life, it is the story of his death inside one of those buildings he tried to save. On May 9th, 1972, demolition was nearly complete at the Chicago Stock Exchange building on LaSalle Street. Preservationists had lost the battle to save the 80-year-old landmark. It was being torn down to make way for a new office tower. Suddenly, the foreman halted demolition. There was a body visible in the rubble. Photographer Richard Nickel had been missing for 28 days. He was last seen in the building. Police called his parents to the scene. I remember him telling me uh, that uh, that he had been warned to stay out of the building, but he said, "Well, I, I can't let that I can't let that stop me." That's how determined he was. Richard Nickel was 43 when he died. He had devoted the last 20 years of his life to photographing and saving the buildings of architect Louis Sullivan. Now he had met his end in one of Sullivan's greatest works. It shatters me that we tear down these obvious works of art. I'll fight the goddamn system to the bitter end. Like Dylan Thomas's poem, Do Not Go Gentle. Richard Nickel. Nichols' love affair with Sullivan's work began 20 years earlier, when Nichol was a student at the Institute of Design in Chicago. His photography teacher, Aaron Siskind, gave Nichol and his classmates a simple assignment, go out and photograph Sullivan's buildings. Nichols' writings reveal it was an assignment that would change his life. At the start, I didn't have the proper equipment. I'd never given architecture a serious thought, and I never heard of Sullivan. Proved to be an education. Siskin told the students to try to capture what he called the essence of the individual buildings. He asked them to look at the details, the structural details, the decorative details. Through his lens, Nickel was captivated by those decorative details, what architects call the ornament of the buildings. It's easy to see why people would be seduced by the ornament. It's a wonderful combination of organic and geometric forms, and they're pulled together because after all, Sullivan wanted his buildings to be an extension of nature. Nickel was hooked. As he continued to photograph the buildings, he began to devour Sullivan's writings. I wasn't very well read at that point, but I never had encountered a personality like that. 
and one that was so involved with life. In the 1880s and 90s, Sullivan and his partner, Dankmar Adler, were on the leading edge of American architecture. In buildings like the auditorium, Adler's brilliant engineering, together with Sullivan's gorgeous and elaborate ornament, helped define a whole new style of architecture called the Chicago School. But tastes and fortunes shifted, and by the time Louis Sullivan died in 1924, he was all but forgotten. In Louis Sullivan, Richard Nickel had found a kindred spirit. Richard had always been something of an outsider, even in his own family. He was in the Boy Scouts, I wasn't. I played baseball, football, he didn't. He read more than I did. He was smarter than I was, too. He was an A student. By the time he was a 25-year-old photography student, Nickel had already been married and divorced. He'd served time in the Army as a paratrooper and photographer. Now he was living in his parents' attic, which would remain his home until he died 20 years later. He read a lot. He'd be up all times of the night, and he'd be playing Bach and Mozart. And of course, my folks didn't know Mozart from the Man on the Moon. Richard Nickel had gone to the Institute of Design to learn to take better pictures, but the school gave him much more. He was becoming an artist. He came to see Sullivan as a tragic hero, a genius who had not received his due, and a model for a life devoted to art. So when other students moved on to other projects, Nickel could not. He was now consumed by a mission to create the definitive study of Adler and Sullivan's work. I am doing this for Louis Sullivan the history of architecture and the force which Sullivan had on that architecture will not be completely realized until this work is completed. Nichol set out in earnest to document every known Sullivan building, but to his amazement, he soon discovered that many of them were not even identified. One day, with nothing more than a mention in a 70-year-old magazine as his guide, he slowly drove west on Lake Street until he found an old dilapidated building with some characteristic Sullivan ornament and an engraved date of 1883. He was able to find many unknown Sullivan buildings and very important ones. And these really rounded out the story of what Sullivan was, who he was, and how his work evolved. And in finding them and then documenting them, it was the last chance for these buildings ever to be known. By 1958, Richard Nickel had discovered and carefully documented 23 unknown buildings by Adler and Sullivan, and uncovered another 15 designs for never-built commissions. He presented these discoveries in a thesis for his master's degree. But the buildings were now coming down almost as quickly as he could document them. Early in 1955, he went to photograph a home on South Lake Park. But when he went back two weeks later, the house was gone. It was a tough lesson, but it taught Nickel to be vigilant. He would get in his car early in the morning with his camera, and he would have his list of buildings, and he would go from site to site. He would look at each building and kind of assess the condition. If there were people living in it, you would make note of it that that one was okay for now. You may go to a building and find that it looks like it's vacant. That means you have to go back to that building sooner than maybe his every two months. Nearly 6,000 buildings were torn down in Chicago between 1957 and 1960 alone, including many Sullivan buildings, as a part of the city's urban renewal program. We must provide the opportunity for every citizen to have decent housing. We must have slum clearance. While we are clearing the slums, we must prevent the spread of blight into the other neighborhoods. The buildings had been cut up into rooming houses and compromised and painted over and changed and in a, a state of ne 
neglect and decay. When somebody did try to say, hey, look, this is something of value, there's a lot of people who just scratched their heads and just didn't get it. It soon became a race between Nickel and the Wreckers. He rushed to photograph buildings before and during their demolition. And then it dawned on him. It was not enough to simply take photographs. He must save as much of the actual building as he could. When I started saving Sullivan ornament from buildings being demolished, it was only to keep it from being turned under. But as the collection grew, I came to feel that it would be more important than any book I could write or any photographs I could make. In 1958, Nichols stopped to photograph a vacant Sullivan house. There, he met two young architecture students who were already salvaging the ornament. Nickel came in and asked us what we were doing. We said we were cutting this sketching out because it, it had Sullivan ornament. So he was impressed with us, but annoyed that we had torn the house apart before he had photographed it. But Nickel soon found out that the two men, John Vinci and David Norris, shared his devotion to Sullivan and were eager to help him salvage pieces of other buildings. He'd come with his Chevrolet and he'd have a bucket in it. And you had your crowbar, large and small, and you had a couple of hammers and you had cold chisels. I thought he was crazy. I, you know, I had no in, I had no interest. I didn't know Sullivan from, from Dr. Magoo. I would say, there's no way we can move this thing. I would guess the thing weighs a thousand pounds. Honestly, I'm more at home in a wreckers environment. Dirty clothes, I'm using rope and pinch bar out in the air and the wind. Very exhilarating. He thought these were masterpieces. Once these pieces are gone, they're gone forever. And uh, that we, have to, we have to save them at all costs. I mean, to him, that was a thing to do. Nickel stored the salvaged ornament outside his parents' home in Park Ridge. Learned last week that the neighbors to the north went to the neighbors to the south, whether they would agree to cooperate in making a complaint about the unsightly appearance of our yard. I suppose it is kind of unsightly, but when it's gone, I don't know what's gonna look much better. To their eyes, maybe the rows of garages or the chrome-plated cars, etc. Nickel had sacrificed everything for nearly a decade to photograph Sullivan buildings and to save pieces of them when they were torn down. By 1960, he was exhausted and discouraged and ready to give up the cause and get a regular job. But then he learned of plans to demolish Sullivan's tallest building, the 17-story Garrick Theater building in the Loop, to make way for a parking garage. What is going on in Chicago? Many smaller, insignificant Adler and Sullivan buildings have gone, but now the Garrick? Great architecture has only two natural enemies, water and stupid men. In 1894, the English architect, Bannister Fletcher, wrote that the building was as important to modern architecture as the Parthenon was to the Greeks. But by 1960, the Garrick had seen better days. The ground floor had been obliterated, the cornice was gone, the building was dirty, the windows weren't taken care of. Nickel had photographed the Garrick earlier, but now, in its last days, he went back to complete the task. It was as if he was determined to not let any inch be forgotten. In all of his years of saving ornament, Nickel had never attempted to stop the wrecking ball and save an entire building, but the Garrick was one building he could not bear to see torn down. On June 8, 1960, Richard Nickel transformed himself from guerrilla salvager to activist. Richard asked us to join him on the picket line, and this really was an unheard of thing. Now it's standard, everybody pickets everything. But for a bunch of academics and photographers and architects 
to actually make placards and walk up and down a very derelict and unwashed building right on Randolph Street by City Hall. It caused a lot of comment, and uh, you're dismissed as being a loony. I am on this earth on Sullivan's behalf, and I have only begun to fight. Saving the Garrick soon became full-time work. For a while, it even looked like the preservationists might win. In the end, though, the building owners prevailed in court and demolition was approved. He couldn't save the building, so now Nickel turned to a pursuit he'd been more successful at, salvaging the ornament. He persuaded the city to fund part of the effort, and he hired John Vinci and David Norris to help him. But this time they had to do their salvaging while the demolition took place. We just went out and bought helmets, which turned out to be liners from helmets in World War II. We just went in the building and said, where do we start? The tactic of the wreckers was to punch a hole in the top floor all the way through, all 14 stories, and have it come out in the ceiling of the theater. And as the building was torn down, all of that refuse would be carried over and dumped into this hole. So they were tearing the top of the building down as we were working below, and they were throwing all this rubble to see a building come down, to see the guts exposed, to see everything hanging, all the wires, and all the internal workings, to see the building flayed before your eyes. It was fascinating and yet tragic. Marvelous being in a work of art under rape. Well, how often do you experience the bones, veins, skin, of a work of art, even if it be in dissection. Losing the Garrick took a great toll on Nickel. After months of fighting and salvaging, he was mentally and physically drained. When a magazine later praised the parking garage that replaced the Garrick, Nickel was incredulous. They wreck one of his masterpieces and you conclude it is a tribute? Would you say that if someone wrecked St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome and erected a garage that it was a tribute to St. Peter? Nickel's idealism never waned, but he became increasingly bitter as Sullivan's buildings continued to fall. What a fool I must be. Why am I horsing around, moving the stones from one warehouse to another, while everybody else is making a dandy living, have their own lives and apartments and houses, etc.? It's even a problem for me to buy a car. By the mid-60s, Nickel was desperate to find a home for the ornament. So he would looked for institutions to take the collection. The Art Institute of Chicago, Chicago Historical Society, they didn't want it. In 1965, Nickel sold the entire collection to Southern Illinois University for $12,000. The university displayed some pieces and stored the rest, planning a museum. If ever I had a compunction about allowing the ornament to leave Chicago, I don't now. They don't understand it or appreciate it. Nichols' disillusionment grew as he watched Louis Sullivan's own home meet an ugly fate. There was a real sense of tragedy and almost pain. A very poetic, sensitive building just being pushed into the dirt. By 1970, Nickel had had enough and was turning his energies to other pursuits. He was now passionate about sailing and had recently bought a new boat. Then he learned that another major Adler and Sullivan building was in jeopardy. Mr. Mayor, while they're putting up this building as a threat, the old Chicago Stock Exchange may come down. Will you step in to do anything to save the building? It's all been decided. Nickel had seen it all before and didn't want any part of this fight. 
everyone is getting worked up for a big emotional jag over the stock exchange. And of course it's unrealistic, since his honor couldn't give a damn. In the end, though, he couldn't stay away. He joined the growing ranks of preservationists in a bitter battle to save the stock exchange. But despite the massive public outcry, the city issued a demolition permit in October of 1971. This time, John Vinci led the salvage team. The Art Institute had agreed to purchase a significant portion of the building's ornament, including the complete interior of the trading room, which was later recreated at the Art Institute. Vinci and Nichols' salvage work was officially completed on January 31, 1972. But as demolition continued, Nichols kept going back in to save more pieces. Meanwhile, he was entering a new chapter in his life. At age 43, Richard Nichol had fallen in love. It was like a 17-year-old kid, boy. He just he was madly in love with her. He met Carol, who was wonderful and really understood what Richard was about. And I think this changed his outlook quite a ways. Dear Tim, I'm afraid our days of adventuring, salvaging, avoiding the cops, etc., in the cause of Sullivan will soon terminate, for me anyway. Richard Nichol and Carol Sutter became engaged in March of 1972. He had been salvaging ornament for 20 years. Now he promised Carol that the stock exchange was the last demolished building he would enter. But he wasn't ready to leave the stock exchange just yet. On April 12, 1972, before he went to bed, Nickel made a list of items he wanted to remove from the stock exchange the next day. In the morning, as Nickel's biographer Richard Cahan recalls, his mother had blueberry muffins on the table. He grabbed one as he headed out the door and said he'd be home for dinner. We'd made arrangements to meet at the building to be able to take this piece down. So I showed up and there was no sign of Richard. And I waited the better part of the afternoon. We were coming down from Wisconsin to meet Carol for the first time. My mother was holding supper or something of that sort. And it got to be, you know, five, six, seven, eight. He never came home. Friday n night I was home and the phone rang around six o'clock and said, did I know where Richard was? The mother called. And I said, no, I know he went to the stock exchange yesterday. She said, yeah, but we're all waiting for dinner and he's not home. Well, my mind went. So we went looking at the stock exchange and looked around for his car, looked around for him. Well, nobody saw him. We couldn't find his car. Then we found the hard hat that he used to always bring for me to wear and a rope. Well, then we knew that he had been at the site. We worked until midnight with flashlights. We went all through and up as far as we can get in the building. But what was different was walking into the trading room and seeing this big hole in the middle of the floor that was never there before. That was Friday. By Sunday night, Nichols' parents reported him missing. On Monday, police dogs found Nichols' briefcase in the wreckage his parents began a daily vigil at the building. After a week with no developments, wrecking resumed. On May 9th, 27 days after Nickel was reported missing, a worker spotted what looked like a shoulder sticking up out of the rubble. It took firemen two hours to uncover the body. A coroner's report later showed that he had been crushed when the trading room floor collapsed. On the day after his body was discovered, a Sun-Times editorial cartoon honored him. The Chicago Daily News characterized Nichols' death as a sacrifice to art, a civic offering on the altar of greed. A Sun-Times editorial called him an inadvertent hero, a martyr who was Chicago architecture's true champion. I think what Richard had to teach was that if you find some way to express your deepest convictions, 
that you should exercise that talent to the very utmost of your ability, even if it leads somehow to your, to your destruction. Richard Nichols' life and his death shined a spotlight on Chicago architecture. A biography, They All Fall Down, by Richard Cahan, tells his full story. Since Nichols' death, the architecture preservation movement has gotten stronger, and Louis Sullivan is widely regarded now as an icon in American architecture. History will indeed view Richard Nichols as one of the heroes of architectural preservation, a man who lived and died for the love of old buildings. I'm John Calloway. Thank you and good night.